So we've been, uh, we've been talking together about the incarnation of Jesus on this earth with us. About rediscovering what it means and, and, and that gift that it really is. That Jesus would come to dwell with us here. The theologian Marcus Borg has a book entitled, Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time. And in it he says, ultimately Jesus is not simply a figure of the past, but a figure of the present. Meeting that Jesus, the living Jesus who who comes to us even now, even now we'll be like meeting Jesus again for the first time. We need this rediscovery of Jesus with us again. That God might dare to risk coming among us. That God would would come, that we might know the love of God for us. Not distantly, not distantly, but up close. That that we might know the presence of God for uh, here for us to to live in even now. This This is the gift of the incarnation, the gift of Christmas that we are rediscovering and remembering in this in this season. We are reading this week the Christmas story from the Gospel of Matthew, um, from chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." All this took place to to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the Lord, angel of the Lord, commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. One of our favorite um, Christmas CDs that we pull out this, this time of year uh, begins with the line, um, begins with the line, Gather round, ye children, come. Listen to the old, old story of the power of death undone by an infant born of glory. We gather in this season to hear this, this old, old story again. To remember the story that that wasn't just a a good story, but a story that that changed everything. And it is worth reciting these stories again, though we we know we've heard them before. Our story today is really just just a little story. It's become grand over time, but, but the depiction of the, the birth of, of Jesus, specifically here in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, is, is short. Just a, just a half a verse at the beginning. Now the birth of the Messiah took place in this way. And then the verse at the very end where it says, Mary had born a son and Joseph named him Jesus. Really just, just a verse and a half dedicated to the, to the birth of Jesus that, that changed everything. And then Matthew moves right on to the, to the wise men. A short little story and easy to miss. As the pastor David Los writes, really most people did miss it. The local news team didn't follow Mary's preg- pregnancy the way uh, that, that they might follow a sports playoff or presidential uh, election. No first century uh, reporters on the scene. There were no baby showers beforehand or christening invitations afterward. From all we can tell from Matthew's story, just about no one noticed. And so I think the story is here for us to notice, to look a little closer for that gift. The larger narrative, larger narrative that, that is going on here, but beyond simply the birth of Jesus, it's, it's a lot more messy and complicated than, than I think we often think about. 
Joseph, he, he planned to dismiss his, his soon-to-be wife, Mary, just a young girl who was now pregnant. And surely nobody would believe her story, and, and the good Jewish law-abiding response was likely more harsh than Joseph would, would want. It's, it's easy to forget that these were, were real people, not just figures in the nativity, but people like us with, with struggles in, in their family, in their, in their relationships. There's heartache here, heartache, really. And Joseph goes to bed with, with all that on his heart. And then it takes a visit from an angel in his dreams for Joseph to see the bigger, better picture, the dream that's in store and at hand for him and the world. Walter Brueggemann has, has spoken about the power of dreams in the Bible. In the scriptures, often the, the terrified and the lost and, and confused people of God find that in, in a dream, God shows up and, and reveals a new way to see things. And that's what we see with, with, with Joseph, who's gone to bed confused and, and scared and, and just wanting to, to do the right thing. And Brueggemann reminds us that, that all the dreams in scriptures have something in common. They represent the intrusion of God into our world. They represent God's communication in the dark of night that, that opens sleepers to a, a world different from the one that they'd known. Susan Andrews says that, that, that the fear and the ugliness of the way things are, it, it needs to be softened by the promise and the power of the way things might be. We need God's dream. We need a, a rebirth of vision, a new way of seeing. It's in the dream that Joseph hears the names that, that his coming child will bear, what he will mean for the world. There's not one, there's not one but two names given in just this short passage. Joseph is to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins, and he will be called Emmanuel. God with us. Two names here and in two names, two promises from God for the world fulfilled in this one child. Joseph, he, he's to name the child Jesus. The Greek name, which, is, which is, comes from the, from the Hebrew Yeshua or, or Joshua in English, which means Yahweh is salvation or Yahweh saves the way it's written here in, in Matthew tells us Jesus was, was not only coming to, to forgive sins, but knowing the end of the story, knowing the completion of the story we haven't even seen the end of yet, where God has reign and all authority to fulfill that dream of God that he has for the world, where, where God, will make, God will make all things new. We will be ultimately saved from the brokenness and the heartache, the mess in the world. God is our salvation. And that news is the good news God came to bring in, in that name, Jesus. But there's a second promise here, too, and a second name, Jesus, as, as God with us, Emmanuel. And this means this is a promise of God that begins for us here and now. God is with us, and, and Joseph, Joseph then awakens. He awakens with new eyes to see the dream of God coming into being with, with, with the promises of God in his heart, and he, he steps into faith, into God's vision. Even while there was nothing perfect, pic, picture perfect, with Mary and Joseph and their struggle that led to the birth of Jesus, nothing ideal Nothing ideal about the whole story, anxiety and, and heartache, a, a houseless family, a messy stable. And I'm thinking, really, maybe, maybe that is the point. I saw someone yesterday say, she said, this is just a friendly reminder that you are not responsible for making this a perfect Christmas for everyone. Your actual Christmas will probably look nothing like your adorable family photo on the Christmas cards you sent or, or didn't send this year because it just felt like too much. And that is okay. That is real life. We are inconsistent, messy, beautiful people who are capable of pity parties one moment and incredible acts of generosity the next. 
And I'm sure Jesus was well aware of our messiness when he chose to be born in a stable. He is no, under no illusion that we have it all together, and yet he is with us through the picturesque moments and the meltdowns. He is Emmanuel, God with us. There's a story about a, a father who was home with the kids one afternoon while his wife went out Christmas shopping. And he was resting on the couch when the kids came in and, and, and said, Dad, we have, a, we have a play to put on. Do you want to see it? And, and, you know, there's a right answer to that question as, it har as hard as it is uh, sometimes to fulfill those fatherly responsibilities. And so he sat up and uh, became the one-man audience for the little play starring his four children, uh, Mary and Joseph, the angel and the wise men. And Joseph came in with a, with a mop handle. Mary came in with a pillow under her pajamas. Um, another child uh, was an angel flapping her arms as wings. And finally, the last child, the eight-year-old, came out with, with all the jewelry on that she could find in the house and her arms filled with three presents. And she said, I am, uh, I am all three wise men. I'm all three wise men. I bring three precious gifts, she said. She said, I bring gold, circumstance, and mud. <laughs> and impressively, the father didn't laugh. The father didn't correct the wise man, but instead reflected on how near the truth it really was that somehow got to the heart of the, the Christmas story. God meets us in this world as it is, loves us, for who we are, wherever we are, in our gold, when we're at our best, in our circumstances, where we might be even now, and even in our, even in our mud, even in the world's deepest of troubles, darkest of struggles, God meets us here where we are. There was a family who, who got their house all decorated for Christmas with the tree, the lights, the nice nativity scene by the door. And it was a few days later that the man of the house noticed that the little baby Jesus uh, from the, nat the nativity scene had gone uh, missing. And he looked everywhere. He, he enlisted the wife and the kids, and they, and they couldn't find it anywhere. And they suspected that the dog had taken it. And several days later, finally, baby Jesus was found with a few bite marks underneath the living room chair in the grime in the midst of the, the, the dirt and the dust in the house. And that is where Jesus comes. Where we find Jesus. Where we least expect him. In a manger in the dirty, dusty, seemingly forsaken places. I have seen and heard and felt myself. That some years... Some years, having that special Christmas Eve feeling just doesn't always come as easy. I have seen people mourning, feeling a kind of lack of, of Christmas spirit, and, and it seems like something where we're all supposed to just automatically have, just automatically have this time of year. You, you should have that Christmas spirit. And maybe we get that feeling sometimes. But, but often, things are, are far from perfect, and life can feel hard and messy. And really, though, I, I'm not sure that that deeper joy and that magic and meaning of this season is, is necessarily something that's just supposed to be, to be summoned up from within us. Rather, I, I think the gift of it is that it's come to us. And the person of Christ into this world, he's come all the way to us. Christmas comes to us. It's God who has done all the heavy lifting and come into our imperfect, our messy, real life, God, with us. And really, it is a good reminder, to, I think, today, as our hearts may be wrestling with this, that we are still yet in that season of Advent, still this season of, of waiting and watching, preparing for the coming. And it's okay to wait and to watch as the gift, gift of, of Christ quietly comes into this world. 
There's a reason that we sing, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. We wait in the life of faith in expectation. For God comes. Hope comes. Joy comes. Christ comes and God will meet us. We watch, we wait, and, and in the midst of our human world, our sometimes very messy and imperfect circumstances, all at the same time, God's dream the beauty of God is present with us, breaking in, intruding into our world, our lives. God with us here. I like the story about how a young pastor and his wife do all the things you might do on Christmas Eve. They string the lights, they hang the ornaments, they, they supervise the hanging of the stockings, they, they tuck in the children, they, they lug the presents down out of hiding and pile them under the tree. And just as they're about to fall exhausted into bed, the husband remembers that his, his neighbor had asked, asked him to, to come by the farm and, and feed his sheep while he was away. And in the busyness of everything that night, he forgot all about them. And so down the hill he goes through knee-deep snow. And he gets two bales of hay from the barn and carries them out to the shed. And there's a 40-watt light bulb hanging by its cord from the low roof, and he, and he lights it. And the sheep huddle in the corner watching as he snaps the, the baling twine, shakes the squares of, of hay apart and starts scattering it. And then they come bumbling and, and shoving to get at it with their little puffs of, of, of breath showing in the air. And he's about to reach out to, to, to turn off the light bulb and, and leave when suddenly he realizes where he is exactly that night. Winter darkness, the glimmer of light, the smell of the hay and the sound of the animals eating. Where he is, of course, is, is the manger. He only just saw it. He almost missed it. He might easily have gone home to bed, never knowing that he had himself just been in the manger Christmas Eve. And really, for God, the world, the world for God is the manger. God has come here to dwell among us. It is by the grace of God that we might see the miracle of God come down to us, that we might awaken with new eyes to see the dream of God for the world, God with us, as we are, wherever we are. And we are invited to respond in faith, to step in and, and to share God's dream to dwell with God in life and, and love, even as God has come to dwell with us. Amen.